A Sunday in London, part of a sketch omitted in the preceding editions. In a preceding paper I have spoken of an English Sunday in the country and its tranquilizing effect upon the landscape. But where is its sacred influence more strikingly apparent than in the very heart of that great Babel, London? On this sacred day the gigantic monster is charmed into repose. The intolerable din and struggle of the weak are at an end. The shops are shut, the fires of forges and manufactories are extinguished, and the sun, no longer obscured by murky clouds of smoke, pours down a sober yellow radiance into the quiet streets. The few pedestrians we meet, instead of hurrying forward with anxious countenances, move leisurely along, their brows are smoothed from the wrinkles of business and care, they have put on their Sunday looks and Sunday manners with their Sunday clothes, and are cleansed in mind as well as in person. And now the melodious clangor of bells from church towers summons their several flocks to the fold. Forth issues from his mansion the family of the decent tradesmen, the small children in the advance, then the citizen and his comely spouse, followed by the grown-up daughters, with small Morocco-bound prayer-books laid in the folds of their pocket-handkerchiefs. The housemaid looks after them from the window, admiring the finery of the family, and receiving, perhaps, a nod and smile from her young mistresses at whose toilet she has assisted. Now rumbles along the carriage of some magnate of the city, peradventure an alderman or a sheriff, and now the patter of many feet announces a procession of charity scholars in uniforms of antique cut, and each with a prayer-book under his arm. The ringing of bells is at an end, the rumbling of the carriage has ceased, and the pattering of feet is heard no more. The flocks are folded in ancient churches, cramped up in by-lanes and corners of the crowded city, where the vigilant beetle keeps watch, like the shepherd's dog, round the threshold of the sanctuary. For a time everything is hushed but soon is heard the deep pervading sound of the organ rolling and vibrating through the empty lanes and courts and the sweet chanting of the choir making them resound with melody and praise never have i been more sensible of the sanctifying effect of church music than when i have heard it thus poured forth like a river of joy through the inmost recesses of this great metropolis elevating it as it were from all the sordid pollutions of the weak, and bearing the poor world-worn soul on a tide of triumphant harmony to heaven. The morning service is at an end. The streets are again alive with congregations returning to their homes, but soon again relapse into silence. Now comes on the Sunday dinner, which to the city tradesmen is a meal of some importance. There is more leisure for social enjoyment at the board. Members of the family can now gather together, who are separated by the laborious occupations of the week. A schoolboy may be permitted on that day to come to the paternal home. An old friend of the family takes his accustomed Sunday seat at the board, tells over his well-known stories, and rejoices young and old with his well-known jokes. On Sunday afternoon the city pours forth its lesions to breathe the fresh air and enjoy the sunshine of the parks and rural environs. Satirists may say what they please about the rural enjoyments of a London citizen on Sunday, but to me there is something delightful in beholding the poor prisoner of the crowded and dusty city, enabled thus to come forth once a week and throw himself upon the green bosom of nature. He is like a child restored to the mother's breast and they who first spread out these noble parks and magnificent pleasure-grounds which surround this huge metropolis have done at least as much for its health and morality as if they had expended the amount of cost in hospitals prisons and penitentiaries 